Hello, everybody. Welcome into the Fantasy Pros Football Podcast. I'm Ryan Warmly, joined today by Derek Brown and Andrew Erickson. It's a Derrickson episode. Debro, we are lucky Erickson is joining us just a few short days <laughs> before his bachelor party. Erickson, congratulations. Where are you going? Whew. Going to New Orleans. Home of Derek Carr, Chris Olave, Tyron Matthew, and a bunch of guys in a salary cap that the Saints continue to make magic with. <laughs> Can we expect any fun uh, Derek Carr related content? Will you be Will you be seeking him out there and trying to uh, ask him why he's not better? Uh, he's the last person I want to <laughs> run into. Honestly, I don't want to run into Derek Carr. I'm hoping maybe I could see Kendra Miller and ask him, like, dude. Are we healthy this year? Can, can we can we get on the field? You, you're better than Jamal Williams. Like, come on. Try and get the inside scoop for us. Well, today we are talking way too early 2024 predictions. These are our top fantasy predictions from each analyst, plus some rapid fire predictions, kind of like superlatives in the second half of the show. We'll also get some audience predictions as well and see if you guys agree with what the folks on Twitter are saying. Just so everybody knows, all of our early 2024 consensus rankings and tiers can be found at fantasypros.com slash rankings. And also, if you've got any dynasty or best ball drafts on the horizon or just want to see how the latest free agency moves affect fantasy football drafts, our mock draft simulator tool is open at fantasypros.com slash simulator. It's a fast and free way to practice for any kind of draft, including dynasty startup drafts and rookie drafts. Again, that's at fantasypros.com slash simulator. Guys, let's jump in. We're going to go five to one with our top predictions. Zebro, give me your number five to start. Well, I'm going to start this off with that. I don't know if this is a low-hanging fruit one or if this is just easy, but come on. Anthony Richardson can be the QB1 overall in fantasy in 2024. And I know we only have a small sample size to work with, but the things that we want to that can get him there is, one, we know the rushing is real. In his two full starts last year, 48 rushing yards per game, that would have been the third best mark amongst all quarterbacks. As well as the two full starts we got, he averaged 25.7 fantasy points per game. And for everybody doing the math at home, pulling out their chalkboards, that would have made him the QB1 overall. And I get we're only going with a two-game sample. So bear with me here. But if you look at just the overall offensive complexion for the Colts, what we saw last year after Anthony Richardson was sidelined, it's great things, man, because we're going to get play volume. So not only do we need the rushing upside to get there, we can get that out of Richardson, but the play volume has to also come along for the ride. And do I think the Colts are going to be a top five passing rate team? No. Do I think they can be top five in pace and mirror kind of what the Eagles did previously, where it was like middle of the road and passing rate, top shelf in pace? Because in weeks six through 18, they were first in neutral pace. They were 11th in place per game. So all the parts or pieces for here are here for Anthony Richardson to smash and outperform his ADP and be the QB1 overall in fantasy this year. If I guaranteed you health, he's going to play 17 games this season. Where would you rank him? Top three. Easy top, top three. three. Yeah, Erickson, what do you think about that? Where would you rank Richardson if you could guarantee health? Probably just put him in the top five. I think that's where I have him ranked anyway. I mean, we're, I'm yep. not going in expecting him to get hurt. I mean, he's a rushing quarterback. I think that his injury risk is pretty similar to most of the other quarterbacks. Just happened to be that last year he just got concussed. So I'm not overly concerned about Richardson. And you already have to pay a lot to get him. Like, you know, mm -hmm. and it, we're expecting a breakout here, especially when you look at some of these early best ball drafts where he is the QB5. And you're like, oh, he's only played four games or whatever. But then it's like, well, I mean, Debro lays out a really strong case for it. It's like, well, you got to pay for it. So, yeah. Erickson, who's your uh, first prediction about? Uh, Brandon Ayuk goes for over 1,500 Ooh. receiving yards and scores double digit touchdowns because I think when it's all said and done, whether Brandon Ayuk is a wide receiver one on a new team or the wide receiver one on the 49ers, if they decide to trade Debo instead of trading Brandon Ayuk, I think that Ayuk is just going to have a career year. He's continued to ascend each of the last two seasons. He was top five in yards per route run last year. When you look at some of his overall numbers on a per game basis just last season, he was seventh in receiving yards per game. Nine, or excuse me, ninth in receiving yards per game, seventh in receiving yards overall. I mean, in 19 games played last year, he had over or right around 1,500 receiving yards. He had eight touchdowns. He had a horrible red zone role. He got like no red zone targets and still scored eight touchdowns. Mm -hmm. So look, Ayuk, one of these seasons, it's just going to all come together for him. Similar to how we saw it with A.J. Brown a couple years back. We knew he was uber efficient. He just needed to land an offense that threw the ball a little bit more, that featured him a little bit more. 
And if that happens, whether it's because they don't keep Debo or they move on from Ayuk to another team, I think the stars are going to align for Brandon Ayuk to just go absolutely nuclear this season, playing in a contract year at just age 26. Debro, when ranking Brandon Ayuk, would you rather see him stay in San Francisco or would you rather see him move? Because it's, you know, he's in a great offense, but there's a lot of mouths to feed. It's an offense where he has technically been in the doghouse before. Um, or he could go somewhere else. He could get be in a much worse scheme, maybe a better quarterback, maybe not. I mean, would you rather see him move or, or stay put? I think in a microcosm, I'd probably rather him stay put just because we have an aging Debo Samuel. We have an aging George Kittle. Both of those guys do carry injury risk, injury histories with them. I'm not saying that they're over the hill. They're 32, 35, whatever. But – they are another year older, getting closer to 30, getting closer to 32. I think George Kittle, what is 30, 31 right now? And so looking at that, I'd rather him stay in San Francisco. Now, yes, passing concerns and where the targets go is always going to be an issue there. But how many times do we always talk about like wide receivers changing teams, building new rapport? What does that look like? And we could be really high on them, but it's probably going to take him down a smidge where I feel like a lot of people would be higher on Ayuk if he went somewhere else. I mean, wouldn't you be Erickson or would you, do you want him to stay in San Francisco? I want them to trade Debo. That's what I want yeah. the most. Like that is yeah. the, I think the, right the ideal situation and not a lot of people are kind of talking about that as a potential um, outcome when it comes mm -hmm. to Ayuk complaining about like, well, I want more targets. Well, how do you do that? Well, you trade Debo as an older receiver and a bloated contract for like a third round, a third round pick like Keenan Allen got a fourth mm -hmm. round pick. You get Debo who is younger. I think you could at least get a third round pick for him. And if the 49ers are going to move on from him anyway, and then sign Ayuk long-term, then that's the play. So I think in an ideal scenario, that's the best way for Ayuk to win. But I mean, if he ends up going somewhere where he's the clear cut wide receiver one, he gets 160, 100. I mean, even on the Patriots, like you can say, like, Oh, it's such a bad situation. Well, once they get Ayuk and then they draft a tackle, it's like, okay, maybe it's not as bad. And now he's going to get 180 targets, which he would never get with the San Francisco 49ers. So those are a couple of things I'm looking at. I just think all in all, when the NFL draft is said and done, we're going to be looking at IU and be like, this guy is going to be a top five receiver, isn't he? Debro, give me your number four prediction. Well, uh, I'm going a little bit off the beaten path to this next one. And it's a running back that depending on where you find him in ranks, I mean, he he's anywhere in that RB three territory for people, but I think we're sleeping on the upside for Brian Robinson. I have him. I believe he could score 12 rushing touchdowns, get into the double digits and be a fantastic value this year. And this all kind of comes down to what do we project for this Washington offense and looking at how it's going to operate under Cliff Kingsbury. And some of this is being projecting, okay, they're going to go quarterback. We all believe they're going to go quarterback. Now we can parse between who we think that is. I personally believe it's going to be Jaden Daniels. If that's the case, is the pass game upside there for Brian Brian Robinson? No, but I don't care about that if he's scoring freaking touchdowns in a really efficient rushing offense. And again, people have concerns about the offensive line. They're probably going to address that in the draft. But looking how Cliff has operated it during his tenure in Arizona, in that span, he was ninth in red zone rushing rate. We have multiple years of pick whichever Arizona running back you want to talk about scoring a ton of rushing touchdowns. It's all real though, man. In that span, he was also eighth in red zone rushing attempts per game. So I don't care if he catches a ton of passes. If we're going to field an efficient rushing offense and when they get in close, it's either Daniels or whoever, or it's Brian Robinson getting the goal line looks because I don't see them going with another guy there. It's not going to be Austin Eckler. Hell, we've had questions about Austin Eckler. Was he going to have a red zone role when Anthony Lynn was a guy that was in the same room with him? And now he's in Washington. So give me all the tutties for Brian Robinson this year. Erickson, you're slightly below consensus on Brian Robinson. I think you have him ranked RB 30 and half PPR. He's a, uh... He's right around RB27 in consensus. Uh, do you think that's about the right range for him to be going in? Do I have, but I also have him ranked ahead of Austin Eckler, which I don't think is consensus. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? I don't mean uh, you've got him three ahead of Eckler. Let's see. Uh, Robinson 27. Eckler is, is RB30. So Robinson is slightly okay. ahead in consensus as well. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I'm just, you know, hesitant to just buy into an offense with a rookie quarterback. Like we don't get the CJ Stroud experience. Most often not like you get the Bryce Young experience where you get a bad offense. And so I don't think that 
you know, Brian Robinson is going to beat me. I do think he's the best value among the two commanders running backs, him and Eckler. Um, but I would like to kind of see the quarterback land there first to kind of see how things kind of shake up. Cause if it is Jane Daniels, okay. So what if Jane Daniels is rushing in all those touchdowns, then where's the Brian Robinson play going to be? So that would be my one. Do concern. we think Jane Daniels is going to do that when he's 200 pounds? I mean, that, that didn't stop him from doing it in college. <laughs> like he was running yeah. and getting smashed. Oh, and he didn't fair. care. That's fair. <laughs> that's I, uh, fair. But we could also have the Lamar Jackson conversation where it's like Lamar, Lamar runs Jackson in and scores, but. No, hold on, hold on. You know that. When he runs in scores and they're not in the goal line or within the five or the ten, he's still going to get the rushing scores, but maybe not in close. That's true. The Ravens don't. They do like to use like a Gus Edwards or someone else, you know, rather than Lamar on the goal line. Um, I think I think it's safe to say whichever quarterback the Commanders come away with at two will be worse than Stroud, but better than Bryce Young. Those are two pretty extremes for them to fall kind of in the middle of uh, next year as a rookie season. Erickson, uh, there's another quarterback. We talked about Anthony Richardson already in the first one. You want to talk about a different Russian quarterback here for your next prediction? Yeah, I think Kyler Murray's going to finish as a top five fantasy quarterback, and this is something that he's already done. You know, he's been in that tier of over 22 fantasy points per game from 2020 to 2021. You know, last year, I was anticipating him to come back slow and not really use his legs, and that was 100% wrong. Like, he came back and averaged 30 rushing yards per game coming off a devastating knee injury. Like, he looked exactly like he would not missed a step in his first game back, and I was like, wow. Like, I my analysis of the injury was just not spot on at all. So, I think Kyler Murray, yes, another year removed from the injury. I mean, just last year, he was still QB 11 in points per game. He didn't have any of his weapons. They're going to add in a talented rookie wide receiver, whichever one you want, whether it's Harrison, Neighbors, Odunze, it's going to be somebody. They're going to add another weapon to this offense. I think they're going to continue to add at the offensive line position. So, I, I mean, he checks off all the boxes of a fantasy QB1. And, I mean, comparing him just like someone like Richardson, I mean, he's way cheaper. Like, he goes outside the top mm -hmm. 10 quarterback. So, I can get similar upside, in my opinion, to Richardson. Again, another rushing quarterback. But, not have to pay nearly as much. So Kyler Murray for me is one of my favorite drafts in terms of best ball drafting. One of my favorite QB targets wrote about it. In one of my best ball articles that came out a couple of weeks back. Kyler Murray is my guy. Debra, where are you ranking Murray? I've got Murray and we're, we're handholding. He was, he was actually in my uh, best ball targets too. him and Jane Daniels. Um, I've got Kyler Murray as QB 11 right now, but to be honest, I feel like that's that's too low. I'm bumping him up right now on the show. I'm going to make him, let's see. Let's put him in the same tier as Joe Burrow and a few. Let, let's get into QB9. The champion of the 2024 NCAA tournament will soon be crowned in DraftKings Sportsbook. One of America's top-rated sportsbook apps is giving new customers a shot to turn 5 bucks into $150 instantly in bonus bets with any college basketball bet. UConn is, of course, the heavy favorites to win at minus 195 to win the whole damn thing. It's basically them versus Purdue since the other members of the Final Four are heavy long shots at plus 1,600 each. Personally, I do expect a UConn-Purdue championship game, which will be awesome, by the way. However you plan to bet the Final Four, download the DraftKings Sportsbook app and use code FANTASYPROS. New customers can bet 5 bucks to get $150 instantly in bonus bets only at DraftKings Sportsbook with code FANTASYPROS, the crown is yours Debro? give me your number three prediction well this is a guy that I, I don't have to tell anybody to draft he's going to go in the first round of every single draft that's out there but i'm telling you right now if t higgins is traded jamar chase is going full 2021 cooper cup if you look over the last two seasons in the six games where chase has played and t higgins has played less than 20 percent of the snaps 30.8 percent target share some of those games again those were browning starts as well and not burrow so let's factor that in as far as production the full season pace for that type of volume 195 targets cooper cup and his magical season 31.7 percent target share 191 targets we know that chase is in a beautiful ecosystem with joe burrow heaving him the rock you give him that type of volume I mean, it, just put him on the moon. He's going straight to the moon. Wide receiver one overall. So, Erickson, d Rose prediction is if T. Higgins is traded, Jamar Chase goes full 2021 Cooper Cup this year. What's your prediction? Uh, I don't care if T. Higgins gets traded because Jamar Chase is going to go Ooh. full on Cooper Cup no matter what. Because <laughs> it's interesting. I, I, I'm, I'm I'm aware of the splits you know, with T. Higgins off and on the field, but it's interesting because d Rose didn't mention anything like fantasy points or yards because – that really hasn't changed whether T. Higgins has played or not. 
Like he has a higher target floor, which makes sense. You take a, another mm-hmm. top tier receiver out of the offense, but the production has still been there regardless of whether Higgins has played or not. So the thing that I'm looking at, and this is something that I've found in all of my wide receiver research, when you're trying to project that really special season, it comes down to red zone targets. Cooper Cup, his special season in 2021, by the NFL and red zone targets. Like this is the easiest path to becoming a wide receiver one overall. Jamar Chase, when Joe Burrow was healthy last year, led the NFL in red zone targets per game. Like this is exactly what you need to be looking for. And that's why Jamar Chase is my wide receiver one. I feel really good about it, even compared to guys like Lamb, Tyree Kill, Justin Jefferson. Look, I was a year early on Chase, I think, last year, just because of the Burrow injury. Nothing really, they didn't have the chance to gel offensively. But for me, I, I just think that this is so the year for Chase. Just looking last seven games played with Burrow in 2023, when Burrow was his most healthy, Chase was on pace for 143 catches, over 1,800 yards, and 12 touchdowns. So I, I love Jamar Chase. That's why he's my one-on-one. That's who I would take first overall in all fantasy drafts. And yeah, it doesn't matter to me. I think if Higgins does get traded, I think that the floor is definitely risen with the targets. But I think that Chase could, I think he could get like 20 touchdowns. Like, like there's no more Joe Mixon. Like he's gone. They have no reason to give it to a running back anymore. Zach Moss, mm-hmm. Chase Brown. No, Jamar Chase. He's our goal line back. Debro, if Higgins stays, because you're obviously, you know, buying in on a massive mm-hmm. Chase year, if Higgins goes, if Higgins stays, where will you be ranking Jamar Chase? I mean, right now, my, I, I've got Jamar Chase as wide receiver, too. The only person that I have above him is C.D. Lamb. But I think they're in the same conversation and honestly a tier by themselves. And people could kind of, as far as bat their eyes at that, like I know Tyreek Hill is still extremely freaking good. He is still another year older. I know Justin Jefferson is still really stinking good. We don't know as of recording this who the quarterback is going to be, and that does play into it. Justin Jefferson as wide receiver one overall with Sammy Darnold throwing the ball. It's tougher to see. So right now I'm projecting Chase. Like I got him at wide receiver two with factoring in T Higgins there. So yes, you're telling me T Higgins moves on. I have no problems bumping him up to number one. Erickson, give me your number two prediction. George Pickens outscores Drake London. So I think we have two wide receivers here that I think saw their stock boost the most in terms of the fallout from free agency, you know, whether it's because of, I think both got quarterback upgrades um, with George Pickens. He got competition taken out from his offense. We'll see what the Steelers do during the draft to add other receivers. Cordell Patterson, I'm not including as someone that's going to take targets away from George Pickens. But for me, George Pickens has already shown like that he can put up fantasy wide receiver one numbers. That's something Drake London has not done yet. So Drake London is a lot more projection, in my opinion, even if you view the quarterback position as a major upgrade, it is but he still has yet to actually produce fantasy points two years in the NFL. Like it's great that he has a high target share. Love that. But who has he been competing for targets with an injured Kyle Pitts? That's it. If Kyle Pitts is going to be healthy this year. Okay. What does that mean? You know, when they're both been healthy, their target share has been pretty similar. Darnell Mooney. He is not necessarily a player that was, he made a big difference last year for the bears, but before that he committed the high target share in his offenses. So is Drake London really that superior of a third-year breakout candidate than George Pickens, especially when you compare their rankings and where they go in drafts? Because Drake London's like a second-round pick. George Pickens goes in rounds five or six. So, again, I think both guys can have better years this year than they've had in the past two seasons. But given the price, I, I think it's closer than a coin flip. I- I- the concern is obviously if the Steelers are super run-heavy, you know, all the touchdowns go through Najee Harris, Jalen Warren, with Arthur Smith, but B. John Robinson was a first round pick. He was a top 10 pick. Like are the Falcons just going to stop running the ball altogether? And how is Kirk Cousins going to respond from his Achilles injury? At least I know the Steelers quarterbacks are healthy between Justin Fields and Russell Wilson. So I I like both guys to improve, but at the cost, I think George Pickens is a better value than Drake London. In tell me if this is a fair assessment, but in looking at the rankings, you're more in line with consensus on Pickens. It's just that you're lower on London it's would you characterize it that same way it's not that you're extra high on Pickens it's that you're just kind of lower than consensus on London I would say so I, I just think that we've we've done this song and dance before the last two years where we saw a, cor- a receiver that had yet to break out and then he got a quarterback upgrade and then we're like oh here we go he's gonna be a top 12 guy like lock him in Michael Pittman didn't deliver Chris Olave didn't deliver Drake London like again like he can be better with Kirk Cousins but what does that actually mean oh he finishes as a top 20 receiver well you draft him as a top 12 guy. Sorry. 
If you guys are anything like me, you have had plenty of terrible experiences buying tickets. I've been to so many games over the years where the ticket buying experience was so bad, I almost just didn't even bother going to the game. Hidden fees that raise prices by obscene amounts, not to mention when you can't even tell if you can trust the seller or how good the views are from the seats. And of course, there are never any available deals to make it just a little more affordable. Thankfully, game time is here to solve those problems. You shouldn't have to worry when buying tickets, and with killer last-minute deals, all-in prices, views from your seat, and their best price guarantee, Game Time takes the guesswork out of the ticket buying process. I was on the app earlier this morning. It really stood out just how easy it is to navigate. The ticket buying experience is smooth. It's immediately clear which tickets are the cheapest and where exactly those seats are. And at the top of the screen, I can see flash deals to make sure I'm getting the best absolute price. Game Time is the only ticketing app that gives you complete peace of mind with your purchase. See the view from your seat before you buy so you know exactly what to expect when you arrive. All in prices show your total up front so you know you're getting a great deal before you check out. And it's so simple, you can buy tickets in seconds with just two taps. So take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code FANTASYPROS for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code F-A-N-T-A-S-Y-P-R-O-S for $20 off. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Now, Debro, you don't agree necessarily with uh, Erickson on the Drake London side of his prediction, mm -hmm. uh, but your prediction is also quite bullish on George Pickens. I mean... I think people are going to think it's bullish, but I don't think it is like, and I'm backing it up with my ranking. I have George Pickens as wide receiver 18 in my rankings. So that leads me to George Pickens is a top 20 wide receiver in 2024. And we've already seen this happen in a shorter stint. When Deontay Johnson was out last year, weeks two through five, George Pickens was 10th in target share, 27.1% target share. He was first in air yard percentage, eighth in yards per route run. And he was also wide receiver 16 in fantasy points per game. Now, I know that people are uncertain about, okay, well, who's the quarterback going to be? Well, here's the thing. We've already seen what iterations of both, like, with offenses with Russell Wilson and Justin Fields look like. DJ Moore had no problems smashing last year as the guy. So, Russell Wilson has supported high touchdown seasons last year for Cortland Sutton. So, it's like, well, if Russ sucks... Justin Fields can get the job done and still support George Pickens. And we've already seen him produce like this last year when Deontay wasn't there. So now Deontay is gone. Okay, well, fine. Let's go George Pickens. So I don't really understand why, like, you look a lot of places, whether you're doing best ball drafts and underdog and other places, it's like George Pickens is a wide receiver three. I, I'm just kind of scratching my head. I don't know why. Bro, uh, so obviously we've hit on Pickens just since we did talk about London, and I know you're a big London fan. You are higher than consensus on London. I think you might have him ranked higher than any expert in ECR right now. It's still obviously early in that process, so maybe that'll change, but you are very excited about London this year, correct? Oh, absolutely. I've got him as my wide receiver seven, and I understand Andrew Anderson is on this show, and he's he's kind of fading Kirk Cousins and the passing attack to a certain extent. I, I, I get the concerns. I'm betting on talent. I'm betting on a player that we've already seen the ability to command high target shares like Erickson was talking about. Now I think we finally get competent quarterback play. And I'm not telling you that Cousins is going to be, you know, QB 12 to 15 in the NFL, top 10, top, whatever. I just want league average quarterback play. And we have not seen that at any iteration of the Atlanta Falcons with Drake London in town yet. Mariota, no way. Heineke, uh-uh. Desmond Ritter, <laughs> come on, no. So I just want league average quarterback play. That happens. Passing rates going up. Target's going to be there. Drake London, smash. Erickson, give me your number one prediction for the 2024 season. New York Jets are going to win the AFC East. They're going to go from last to top 10 in touchdowns scored per game. And Brees Hall is going to be the fantasy RB1. So I think that the Jets are this weird buy low type of team because of what happened last year with their offense and basically got destroyed after Aaron Rodgers uh, ruptured his Achilles. But I think there's reason to be optimistic for gang green this year. You look at the other teams of so the AFC East, the Patriots are rebuilding. Um, they don't have a quarterback, so they are not going to be competitive necessarily in wins and losses. Miami Dolphins are kind of in this weird limbo state. They just lost a bunch of talent in free agency and they didn't have anything to kind of put back in its place they don't have a lot of draft picks and they have this Tua contract that's also looming like kind of putting them in a weird place of are they gonna be as good as last year and you have the bills who i feel like 
did they kind of just miss their window to really take a chance at the Super Bowl? So I think the Jets, as a t- I mean, if there's any team that's all in, it's it's the New York Jets. They signed two 33 old tackles as band aids on this offensive line to help protect Aaron Rodgers, who's also over 40 years old. So if any team does not care about 2025 at all, it's the Jets. They care about 2024. And how do they score points in 2024? Brees Hall. That's how you do it. The last time we saw Brees Hall against my Patriots, the guy almost had 40 touches in a game against the league's best run defense. So Brees Hall, I think, is just slated to go absolutely nuclear this year. Again, finished second among all running backs in yards from scrimmage last year in 18 weeks. First in catches. And this was him having the second to last rushing success rate in the NFL. Like, he could not rush for a lick, and yet he still was able to put up yardage from both receiving and rushing because of his explosive ability. So I think it's going to be the Brees Hall show. I really think this offense is going to be going through him, especially with Garrett Wilson, adding Mike Williams, again, another Band-Aid wide receiver fixture to this offense. So again, I've never, I don't think I've ever been high on the Jets in my like, entire existence. Um, but in 2024, I think the Jets are a good bet, and Brees Hall is going to be the guy I'm going to put my chips in on. I respect the conviction in Hall, and I, I'm really excited for Hall this year as well. I don't think I could justify not having Christian McCaffrey as RB1. And in fact, if you look at our early ECR rankings, only two people in the industry that we have in our rankings do not have McCaffrey number one. You are one of them, Erickson. Of course, having him at two Who's behind. One? Who's the other Reese smart Hall. one? Uh, smart Ke- one? Ke- Kevin Steele. At least as of the most time, the most recent time he updated this. Well, you said you said okay. justify. What does that I mean? That to me, that sounds like oh well. We I think have to I put think him coming off this. I think coming off the season that we just saw from McCaffrey, and I don't know why we have much reason to expect next year will look drastically different. I just don't know how you can put like Brees Hall would need to have the season that McCaffrey just had to surpass him. We just we just saw McCaffrey do it, and I don't know why we would expect outside of you know a, an unfortunate injury. I don't know why I would expect him to not do it again. Well, I mean, I mean Debra, what do you think? I mean, I, look, I, I'm actually, I feel like I'm straddling the middle between both these takes. Uh, I've got Brees Hall as my fourth overall player right now and my RB2. So I'm, I'm, I mean, Erickson's basically, we're, we're riding in the same party bus. He's just driving. Well, well, Debro, you didn't have McCaffrey as RB1 last year. So why are you now putting him back as RB1? Because a lot of the reasons where I bumped him down from RB1 was a lot of, okay, does, is he going to share any of the red zone touches and we saw that did not happen with Elijah Mitchell because Elijah Mitchell just can't stay healthy. I mean, it, it's sad, but true. And so this year, I mean, w- look back at last year. And even though McCaffrey was playing so many snaps, it's not like San Francisco ran him into the ground. They weren't giving him 28, 30 touches a game. Uh, some of that's because of the pace and things like that. And he could play all those snaps because they're running a slow offense and they're playing, you know, less plays per game. So, I mean, for, for CMC, I just... Looking in the metrics, it's hard for me to justify, okay, is he going to, outside of injury worries and things like that, I think he's firmly still in the prime of his career. So it's, I, I'm with you on that Brees Hall could be the RB1 overall this year. I think it's a two-horse race, though. I think it's CMC and Brees. I just think it's a better bet to bet on a guy who's going to be 23 years old on an ascending offense. Disagree. Versus, you'd rather bet on a 29-year-old running back than a 23-year-old running back in his uber prime. Like, I mean. I, I think we're making both are sound bets to make, to be honest. Well, you can only I pick mean, one overall. You can't get both on your team. How, how old did you say McCaffrey was? Did you say 29? I think he's like 27. He's not 20. He's either turning 28 or 29. He's, t- he's turning 28 before the season. Okay. He's 27 currently. Okay. Yeah. 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 Sorry. I, I, I mean, now I, now Erickson's trying to make him even older. Okay, I mean, I'm good lord. Chris like, Doug is he's already younger than Christian McCaffrey. <laughs> yes, he is, he is definitely younger. <laughs> I, I, I don't think he's so old that that's a concern for me. Well, what about um, that he's coming and, off a season where he had like 400 touches and like the track record of that is actually like, look at all the running backs, Josh Jacobs. He came off a big year of 400, like of a ton of touches, led the NFL in touches and did not finish as an RB one. Like I did the reason this is why I was fading Jacobs last year. Cause he led the NFL in touches. And then we look at every single running back, like Ladane Lane Thomas is the only guy that really ever returned into another top five running back. And I think Zeke one year too, but neither of those guys finishes the RB one again. And, and that includes McCaffrey, the year he came off one of his massive seasons in Carolina. The next year he got hurt. So, again, if everyone's just going to ignore the fact that this guy's coming off such a massive workload, he's older versus a young running back like Brees Hall, who's well, shown that he can be the RB1 overall, like, that's the bet that I'm going to make. So, 
I think I think the conversation between CMC and Jacobs is a different one though because there's a big volume gap there too. Like CMC had I think it was about 340 touches last year. Now Josh with the playoffs. Jacobs walked out of 20. Now with the playoffs. Well, yes, we can count the well, I know we can count the playoffs too. I'm talking about in the regular season, but yes, still you're, you're right still about count. You're right about the you're right you about the playoffs. The playoffs it still counts. <laughs> The other thing about this is Josh Jacobs had over 400 touches in that season. So I, I'm with you on the volume and stuff. I, I, I get it. I get it. But the other side is we saw CMC stay fully healthy that season. I'm not going to rule out that he could do it again. I, although I concede your point. It's not like I'm fading Brees Hall here. He's my RB2. He's a top five player for me. But you won't yeah, I, I you also, get your pick of the litter. I also quite like Hall, and again, I don't want to knock your uh, enthusiasm for Hall, and we can move on from the point after this, but uh, I just, I, it, it feels like it will take a special, barring injury, which could happen, you're right, he did have a lot of touches last year, barring injury, it feels like it will take a truly special season to knock McCaffrey out the perch, given the talent he still obviously has and the situation that he's in. Um, but I, I like that this is supposed to be, you know, kind of a way too early fun prediction. So, so I, I, uh, I respect the you conviction guys having there. Fun? I'm just getting mad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm having a blast. I, I'm having a great time. Uh, Debra, give me your number one prediction. Erickson saving all the, the fun for new Orleans yes. right now. So <laughs> yeah, he, he's getting all the hate out right now. I look, there's a guy that I, people, I threw this out on Twitter and people hated this take. And I, I, I don't get why, because in previous years, people have had no issues betting on Travis Kelsey, taking him in the first round of drafts. And last year, we saw Travis Kelsey-esque production out of Trey McBride. But apparently, saying Trey McBride is going to be a top 15 overall player in 2024, and he's worth taking in the first round of fantasy drafts, is a crazy thing to say. And I, I, I get it. Like I'm not fading, again, talking about similarly talented tight ends, that are young. I'm not fading Sammy Ballgame. I have Sammy Ballgame as my tight end too, but we also still have to talk about he is going to compete for targets with Amon Ross St. Brown, Red Zone looks, as well as that rushing offense. Who is there for Trey McBride right now? And even if you put, okay, let's say he gets Malik Neighbors. Let's say he gets Marvin Harrison Jr. to compete with targets with. That's still only two guys. I'm not worried about Michael Wilson. I'm not worried about Greg Dorch. Okay, he's it's a great story and stuff, but he's not commanding 150 freaking targets. Last year, Trey McBride, weeks 8 through 18, amongst all tight ends, first in weighted opportunity, first in target share, fifth in PFF receiving grade, fourth in yards per route run. He's top five in every single thing that you look at. And we can talk about, oh, the fantasy points per game. He scored only three touchdowns, and he had the fourth most red zone targets over that span. So give him another touchdown, two, three, however many you want to do. He still would have been better. I look at his production, and he's entering the prime of his career, and he could take another step forward, and he could lead the, the Arizona Cardinals in targets this season. He could get 150 freaking targets. How is that not worth and cannot be a top 15 player in fantasy? Somebody's got to tell me because I don't understand it. It can happen. So I, I'm in ECR. Trey McBride is is tight end four. He's at the bottom of tier one, and I That's totally crazy. Well, I totally I totally get the case for him over Kelsey and Andrews. You're taking the guy who's on the upswing of his career rather than you know back end of his prime or or past his prime uh, with Kelsey and Andrews. But if you're taking McBride and the, or if you think he's going to finish as a top fifteen player, where do you think Laporta is going to finish? Because I think Laporta like rightfully is is thought of as the young tight end that people are maybe most excited about. I mean, maybe not rightfully. I shouldn't say that. But but it seems like the mm -hmm. hype train is very much there for Laporta and partially there for McBride. So if you think McBride's going to be a top 15 player, where do you think Laporta is going to be? I've got Laporta tight end too. Um, now looking, I've got him, he's lagging a little bit in my overall rankings. Like I think that if you look at Laporta, he should be in the same conversation as a second round pick as Mark Andrews has been in previous seasons, like whether it's second or third round pick and where that falls for people. Like, I think that's the the five on both of these guys are in a tier by themselves alone in my rankings as tight end one and tight end two. Erickson, what do you make of McBride versus Laporta? I think that McBride is by far the better value. I don't think it's even close because he goes rounds after Sam Laporta because that's all I'm looking for when it comes to the onesie positions is value. Like, that's what I want. Like, who can fish this tight end mm -hmm. one? Like, okay, maybe you can make the case that Laporta has a 
slightly better chance at McBride, but I don't. I think that Debra laid out the case that that's not really reality, especially when you just look at it's who not. he's competing with targets with. I like the Cardinals offense. Talked about Kyler Murray earlier. High on him. If Kyler Murray hits, well, who's he bringing along with him? Probably Trey McBride. And the biggest difference between their fantasy scoring last year was touchdowns. Trey McBride didn't score any touchdowns. Sam Laporta scored 10. That could flip because that's ultimately what changes the most year to year is that touchdown production, the volatility of scoring. So if McBride ends up on the higher side of that variance that he's going to easily outscore Sam Laporta as the number one target, most likely on the Arizona Cardinals. If you need new tires for your car, Discount Tire is your go-to. They have exceptional service, and you get a 30% shorter average wait time when you buy and book online at DiscountTire.com. They have this really cool feature called Treadwell, which is an online tire buying guide that gives you transparency on tire performance, as well as personalized recommendations based on your location and driving habits. Discount Tire is also the largest independent tire retailer in the country, so it has the biggest selection of tires and wheels. And here's a pro tip from the experts at Discount Tire. You can prevent wear and boost gas mileage by keeping your tires properly inflated. Tire pressure supports the weight of your vehicle and is important to check for safety. So if it's been over a month since you last checked your tire pressure, stop by one of their local stores for a free tire safety and air pressure check. Discount tire. Let's get you taken care of. Guys, let's move into the rapid fire questions segment here. I'm going to give you guys some kind of prediction or superlative, and you will give me your selection. First one, fantasy comeback player of the year. Debra, who you got? Oh, it's Garrett Wilson. That's that's the low-hanging fruit. He's coming back from having to deal with Zach Wilson for an entire season. So not coming back from an injury, but eh, the ego, the pride, the target share, the catchable targets were all hurt in the process. All of the volume stuff is there for him. He was wide receiver 32 in fantasy points per game last season. The wide receiver six in expected fantasy points per game. I'm sure given how high Erickson is on the Jets, he agrees with that one. So Erickson, who is your comeback player of the year? Jalen Waddle, Miami Dolphins. Let's go. Nice. PPR gold. This is a breakout PPR monster next year. Erickson? Deontay Johnson. Does it again. Does it again. Does it again? Uh, yeah. Uh, how many targets do you think Dante Johnson is getting this year, by the way? Uh, well, he's going to need a life jacket because he's going to drown. <laughs> drown in targets. t <laughs> <laughs> yes. who's your PPR gold? Oh, this is Tank Dell for me, man. And I don't think that people understand in the seven games that Tank Dell and Nico Collins were both full-time players, Tank Dell, not Nico Collins, actually led the two of them in target share, 22.5% to 22.1%. He led the team in air yard share, weighted opportunity, and fantasy points per game. So I think, we're look, if we're assuming that Tank Dell, and I've seen all the workout videos, that he's fully healthy, <laughs> he's going to catch a ton of balls this year from, from C.J. Stroud. By the way, everybody, make sure you're following Debro on Twitter if you want a preview of who we're going to talk about on the show. Because <laughs> pretty much every there. time I see I him knew. tweeting stats, I'm like, oh, that's a player that he already said he wants to talk about today. So yep. <laughs> you always know it's coming. Uh, boldest <laughs> fantasy prediction. And our producer was saying, you know, something that's like a 20% chance of happening roughly. Debro. Julio McLaughlin will be a top 24 running back in 2024 he's discount Devon Achan you're talking about undersized runners sharing backfields and yes I'm not saying that Javante Williams is going anywhere but Javante Williams was not healthy he was not good he was not breaking tackles last year maybe that looks a little bit better in the year 2024 but what I can tell you is Jaleel McLaughlin if you look at every single efficiency metric out there he was top 20 in everything. Explosive run rate, missed tackles force, yards at the contact per attempt. Oh, and look at that. He was also top five in yards per route run. So if he can shove Samaje P. Ryan into the shadow realm and he can get enough of a red zone roll, I understand we have questions about the quarterback, but as, if that gets answered in the draft, he's the best pass catching option that they have on that team in that backfield. He can get dump offs and he could be fantastic this year. Erickson, what's your boldest prediction? I'm ready for all those Bo Nix dump offs. To, uh, I, I would, oh, I would, baby. To Leo Let's go. The only reason I want Bo Nix in Denver, man. He's yeah, I'm here for it. He's so at ready. six point, whatever, seven A dot is going to be. <laughs> Jeff's kiss I'm for just so Leo McGoff. They hit different. <laughs> <laughs> um, so my bold prediction, I already kind of mentioned it, but Brees Hall, RB1. And because of that, he's going to be the first player drafted in 2025 fantasy football drafts, which I encourage people Love to think it. about that exercise. You know, I just think McCaffrey going to be 29 years old next year. Is he really going to be the one one again? And if he's not, then who would be? So I like Brees Hall as a candidate and B. John Robinson as well. 
I was gonna say Bijan is is the guy I kind of think about who could be talked about as 2025 mm-hmm. 101 uh, or maybe Jamar Chase if he really does go full uh, Cooper 2021 Cooper Cup uh let's go to the sleeper pick of the year this is a player outside the top 100 in half PPR overall expert consensus rankings Erickson who is your sleeper pick of the year I'm gonna go with uh Roshan Johnson I know this is rapid fire but Debro mm. keeps you know adding in more so I'm gonna add another I'm gonna add in another layer here Rapid-ish. of, of we got Roshan time. Johnson um <laughs> so for me Roshan he kind of reminds me a little bit of of Kyron Williams where We have a coaching staff that has been very vocal about loving this guy, right? But as a rookie, you know, it seemed like they were going to give him a bigger role, but then he got hurt. He got an injury. You know, last year with Roshan, he suffered a concussion, and they had other running backs, and they're rotating guys, and the offense was kind of a mess. So we never got to really experience, I think, a full-fledged Roshan Johnson type of experience. Now, obviously, they brought in DeAndre Swift. That's made Roshan Johnson really cheap. But it comes down to goal line production, in my opinion. Like, who could score or who could earn that role in this offense that Caleb Williams, DJ Moore, Keenan Allen, like this Bears offense could break records potentially, at least from a Bears perspective. 4,000 yards is in the cards this year for the Bears. I love it. You quantified that from a Bears perspective. <laughs> <Yeah>. like, 30 <laughs> passing touchdowns is in the range of possibilities for more records 4, passing being yards. broken <laughs> for the Bears quarterback and Bears passing game. So just looking at the last two years, DeAndre Swift, his teammates, right? His teammates have averaged over 16 rushing touchdowns, Jamal Williams and Jalen Hurts. So maybe it's not a DeAndre Swift thing where it's like he, or or more, it is a DeAndre Swift thing where he's not a good uh, red zone rusher. Like teams have looked to gravitate away from him at the goal line. And if that's the case, that could be Roshan that then stumbles into 10, 12, who knows, 15 rushing touchdowns if this offense does kind of take off in year one with Caleb Williams. So that's why I like Roshan Johnson as a sleeper. Debra, who's your pick? The DeAndre Swift stands are coming for you, Erickson. I'm just going to throw they've been that out coming, there. I mean, they've, come, been coming, they're, they're they're they've been coming. They came at the Lions. They came at the Eagles. And what do you know? I'm still standing. So. <laughs> they got the lighters. They got the pitchforks. They're ready for you, man. They will be at your door later today, man. But a guy that I got to talk about here, again, I've brought him up numerous times. It's Marshawn Lloyd. I Assuming he goes round three, round four of the NFL draft, and I fully think that's absolutely possible. I've talked about this in spades on the uh, NFL draft show with Thor, uh, he's top 20 in every elusivity metric that you could pull up in the last two years. He's got a three down skill set. I think he's going to crush this year. He's a mean running dude. He's a tone setter. I love his game. I am with you. I really like Lloyd as well. And speaking of rookies, surprise rookie impact player. And this is going to be somebody other than the obvious name. So we're not picking neighbors or Marvin Harrison Jr. or Roma Dunze or Caleb Williams or any of those guys, but somebody other than the obvious name, surprise rookie impact player. D bro, you can go first. I was going to pull up Jermaine Burton for this, but I, I I can't get away again. We're I'm talking about guys that I'm willing to make the bet on. It's Javon Baker, dude. I'm not going to shut up about him. I love his game. I love the fact that I think he's going to go higher than people expect in the NFL draft. Uh, we're, we're talking about a player that was eighth in yards per route run last year. I I don't care about the testing stuff. He's a freaking stud. D-Bro, D- uh, just if for listeners that are just kind of tuning in, Javon Baker, what, what, what school was he? What? UCF, right? UCF. Yep. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yep. Yeah. I think he's a little lesser known. I know you've been sort of uh, banging that drum, Debra, for a while. Trying now, to. But... Trying to turn it up to 11. I want people to hear it, man. Former Definitely. Alabama transfer. Five star recruit. Mm-hmm. Transferred. Uh, Erickson, I love your pick for surprise rookie impact player as well. Yeah. In hindsight, mm-hmm. like it would have probably made more sense to like, pick a wide receiver given how good the wide receiver class is, but you know. What's what's the fun in that? So I went with a running back who ran a horrible 40-yard dash time. Mm-hmm. Audric Estime, running back out of Notre Dame, because I just don't care. Like, I, I, I just enjoyed watching him so much. And if the draft capital kills him, whatever. He's just got to get on the field. Like, that's what I'm afraid. He's just, just got to get a chance somewhere on some team to show what he can do. And I think Audric Estime, a massive running back, super efficient. His last year at Notre Dame. But if Kyron Williams could get it done at Notre, like after running a horrible 40, and he could, he could thrive at the NFL level. I think estimate two can do the same as long as he gets a chance. So we'll see. So similar guy in his rookie season, you pounded the table for is Audric estimate your new Tyler Algier. Cause you were super high on him. And, and I, 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 I poo pooed the take, but he, he did show out. Is he your new Tyler Algier? He probably is like, because there's that one metric that I've looked at the most when it comes to running backs. And it's like, it's yards per snap yards per play, basically like how efficient are you at creating yards when you're on the field on a per snap basis, whether it's receiving, whether it's rushing. 
And that was something that kind of got me onto Algier, that got me onto Elijah Mitchell, mm -hmm. Ramondre Stevenson, and most recently, Audrey Estime. Like he 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 Beautiful. graded really highly in that metric for me. And the 40 yard dash time was like was tough for me to bash because it's not even like the fact that he's like slow or anything like that. Like if you watch his film, like you can realize he's not like a a plotter, but I'm just concerned, like, oh, well, he ran a four, six, five, seventh round pick. And it's just like that really just hurts any type of floor running back and offer if you go mm -hmm. that late. But I mean, I think that the size enough is appealing with him for NFL teams that I think hopefully he can at least maybe crack the end of day two, if not earlier in day three. Debra didn't didn't SMA run faster at his pro day? I forget what the actual number. Those was. are all myth. Times. He did. He he <laughs> did. But I, I the video is out there, man. I I, I, I picked it apart and I was fake. like, I, I was like, fair. they were tying him in the four or fives, and I was like, mm, that's that's not a real. Well, time. well, I, but. I, I will say he ran in the four sixes, so he's not he's not in the Elijah Holyfield stand stand uh, situation anymore. He didn't run a four seven, so the hope light is turned back on. <laughs> I I really liked. I, similar to Erickson, like I just thought SMA was really fun to watch. Like at Notre mm -hmm. Dame, he, I like I I've been saying this a lot about this class on the Dynasty feed, but to me, this running back class, I do really like Lloyd. I think Lloyd can be a three down guy. Most of the running backs in this class, I see as guys who can fill a role. And I can very yep. easily imagine the role that Audric Estime fills. And that appeals to me, especially as a rookie, a guy who, if he goes to the right team and is used in the right role, I think can be a valuable player, uh, you know, for an NFL team and possibly for fantasy. I was saying that I would have loved prior to them signing Derrick Henry. I would have loved him on the Ravens as the Gus Edwards, like guy is going to get all those touchdowns type, you know, not anymore now that they have Henry, but something like that is what I would like to see him in. And I think he can be pretty good in. Well, and continuing to draw the, the correlation between Estime and Algier, Algier was also a fifth round pick. So we're talking about outliers. Yeah. And I remember arguing with you because I was like, dude, the Falcons would have took him yep. in the fourth round. But they didn't yep. have any fourth round picks. No, I, I got to give you your flowers, man. You were absolutely <laughs> right on him. That's why I wanted to bring it up. I'm like, I'm not very high on Estime, so maybe I'm just eating crow again this year. We'll we'll see. Uh, Devo, you have a rookie for your surprise top five fantasy quarterback. It's Jaden Daniels, baby. It's going to be all Jaden Daniels. We want the rushing upside. We want the downfield shots. We want all those things. Well, guess what? You get it with Jaden Daniels, man. If there's a guy that could be top five this year and everybody's like, well, geez, I wish I wasn't drafting him as a QB2 in early best balls right now, which is insane. Uh, yeah, it's Jaden Daniels. Does that does he need to go to the right situation for you to feel that way or will it be regardless? Like nope. if he's the pick for the Patriots at three, and that's been talked about a lot as like not a very good situation for a rookie quarterback to be dropped into, would that change this pick for you? Nope. He's going to run. We know he's going to run. So... As long as he runs and we get some passing production because he's really stinking good from the pocket, I think it could still happen. But I want to see him on the Commanders. I've said that, been there, still there. Erickson, who's your surprise top five fantasy quarterback? Well, I mean, the situation with Jaden Daniels won't be that bad when he's thrown to Brandon Ayuk again, <laughs> back to their 2019 yeah. days at Arizona State. So that's going to happen. So, all right. Um, my surprise top five quarterback, and I really don't like talking about this player, but Deshaun Watson. Yeah. I just, mm. he just checks off too many boxes when it comes to rushing production. And even last year, like he was still scoring fantasy points, even though how bad he was. So I don't really know if Deshaun Watson is ever going to turn it on again. Like I really don't know. It may be just that the, his prime is just past him. But the fact that this guy had once led the NFL in passing yards, like I'm still intrigued, especially with how cheap he is in drafts now. So I kind of bite my tongue whenever I draft him in best ball drafts. Um, but He's someone that's can be really productive. And I mean, they have weapons. Like, it's like hard to look at the situation and be like, oh, this is horrible. It's like, I mean, all they do is keep adding wide receivers. I mean, they're, they're cast off players for the most part, but he runs. I mean, if, I mean, if he can do like 80% of oh, Joe Flacco, don't. like, come on. So I was going to say, don't, 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 don't make us buy into Jerry Judy again. I don't know if I can. I don't know if my heart can take it again, Erickson. I just don't know. Im imagine uh, after the Browns had traded for Deshaun Watson, telling them that one day, you would be saying if he can be eighty percent of Joe Flacco, Dude, that's where we're at. <laughs> that is really disheartening. If and it's not a, wrong. Yeah, it's yeah, really it's not wrong. Spot on. Uh, <laughs> Devo, give me your uh, bust alert. This is a player inside the top fifty in our half PPR rankings. I, people are drafting TJ Moore and ranking him like Keenan Allen's not a thing. Keenan Allen's just going to be in the retirement home. Keenan Allen's terrible, and that. I don't know what you're looking at if you think that all of those things are true. 
DJ Moore is being drafted and ranked as a wide receiver one in multiple different spots, and I just can't get there, man. He was the wide receiver 19 in expected fantasy points last year. Now you have a guy that commands targets right next to him. I, I don't get it. Bust. Erickson, who's your bust? Devon A. Chain. And that's, I think you're way down on him uh, relative to Kentucky. Where do you have him ranked then, Erickson? I mean, I don't have him that ranked when it comes to, like, running back specifically. I think that he's still... I think I still have him as a what RB fourteen. I just I just don't like drafting running backs that don't have touch floors. Like I, I, know, I was, maybe I'm yeah. wrong with that, but that's not. Well, where do you have Gibbs then? Because it's a similar conversation. Well, I Gibbs mean, if, was if you're high on Gibbs. Why do you hate a, a chain? Well, because Gibbs did it last year, stayed healthy, and is viewed as the actual starting running back on his team. Like that's well, not the case with. I just think and, that there's, and, there's 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 a lot of scenarios where I just see a chan just failing. Like, even last year, like, as good as he was, it's like, but, I mean, especially during the beginning of the season, but, like, he left a lot to be desired at the end of the year. Like, you were like, hold on to this guy, but he's going to save me. And then he never did. Like, he never showed up at the end when it really mattered. They extended Raheem Moster. Like, I don't know what to think of Moster either because he's someone that I think everyone else is writing off and I kind of felt the same way. But it's like, are we being too aggressively writing him off? Like, should it really be this stark where Achan is a top 10 running back and Raheem Moster's, like, outside the top 30? Like. I mean, that's, I don't necessarily disagree with it, but it's like, is that really right? Uh, so I just think and, that there's a lot of scenarios where it doesn't pan out. To to your point, you're actually not that low on him. Um, and at the, like, positionally amongst the running backs, you're low on him overall. Is yeah, so I like, I just like a little more wide receivers yeah. then in general. Yeah, than, than that's, him. Fair. that's uh, fair. Post-hype sleeper, Erickson, you can go first here. Christian Watson. I, I begging Ooh. the hamstring monsters to just go away. <laughs> Because I think that the Packers are just an interesting offense. And even last year, you know, I want to, I, I like Jaden Reed a lot. So I was really happy to see him be really productive. But throughout the entire season, like Jordan Love sp spread the love in the offense. Like there wasn't really no one player that commanded such a commanding target share where I think they're going to continue to spread the wealth between all the talented playmakers. And Watson is now super cheap, but we've seen his ceiling when he's healthy and he's a monster. So it's just a matter of keeping the hamstrings healthy. I think he could bounce back after being really hurt in his second year. Debra. Yeah. The guy I got to bring up here is Zamir white. And, and the reason I frame him as the post hype guy is when he came out, everybody was like, Oh, well he's, he's going to compete with touches. I mean, basically it was the same kind of conversation we had last year and he got tank big speed. He didn't do anything in his rookie season. And then when we finally saw him get on the field last year, it was like, oh, okay. And now the Raiders have invested in him. Like, he's going to be their lead guy. Josh Jacobs went out the door. And Zamir White, we've already seen the production. So I'm going with Zamir, man. Like, I've got him as a top 24 running back right now. Uh, let's go to best tight end value. This is a guy outside the top four in our rankings. d Row, you can go first. I feel like we've talked about this guy in numerous seasons in numerous different spots and we keep waiting for him to break out and I'm I'm in on it right now. Johnny Smith, man. Like next to we've talked about a lot of dolphins on this show, but where do the touchdowns go and I think they firmly can go to Johnny Smith in this offense. Last year Tyreek Hill, Jalen Waddle soaked up 53% of the air yard of the target share, 74% of the air yard share. Nobody else in that that entire room commanded targets, red zone targets, anything. And now Johnny Smith is going to be the clear number three option in this passing attack. Pfft, yeah, he could be a top 12 tight end and people are not drafting him like that. If Johnny Smith couldn't do it with Arthur Smith, how can he do it anywhere else? I, I find myself <laughs> wondering. Uh, Eric, see who's your best tight end value? Tucker Craft. Craft. Single, oh, baby. baby. I draft Tucker Craft in every single best ball draft because he always goes after Luke Musgrave. And I just think that's wrong. I, I think Tucker Craft is he was a better prospect. Love it. Luke Musgrave had his chance to start and then he got hurt and then they've had Tucker Craft come in and he was just better and he played over Musgrave. So I have Love Musgrave it. or excuse me, I have Craft confidently ranked over Musgrave. Again, it's going to be tough, I think, for either of them to really carve out that massive role if both stay healthy. But Musgrave has not been that guy. Like Musgrave has not been someone that stayed healthy at the college level and didn't stay healthy last year. So again, it's another Packers player. I think one of these Packers players, again, Jaden Reed is the most expensive guy, but one of these Packers players, if somebody goes down, like, these there's so much talent in this offense that if we can get targets concentrated onto one or two players, whether it's Kraft, Watson, Reed, etc., like you could see these guys really take off after most of them stayed healthy, or at least some of them stayed healthy last year. So uh, Kraft is that dude. Debra, I, I want to ask you one question Kraft. before we get off the um 
the bull prediction or the rapid fire questions, but when it comes to Zamir White, is there like a threshold of running backs that the Raiders could draft where you would feel less confident? So it's like Raiders draft Marshawn Lloyd. Okay, Lloyd's RB1. I have to, like, where does that kind of fall for you where it's like, okay, they added this guy. I think White's still the guy. But if it's, oh, they added Jalen Wright, they added Marshawn Lloyd. Okay, now I'm concerned about Zamir White. Where does that cut off for you kind of hit? I think it's if they draft a guy inside of the top four rounds of the NFL draft, considering all the other needs that the roster has, if they go that direction, then I'm a little bit more concerned about Zamir. Um, we could parse out like, you know, pass catching and things like that. But I think it's more just the draft capital for me. If, if it's a guy that they're filming out the depth chart, like it's round five or later, it's the Zamir show. Last rapid fire question. Who do you trust more, Derek Henry or Rashad White? They are back to back in our staff consensus rankings. <laughs> Erickson, Derek Henry or Rashad White? Rashad White. Ah, oh, Derek Henry. It did it, 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 it's Derek Henry. The answer is Derek Henry. <laughs> yeah, it's Derek Henry. Yeah. Derek if if Gus Edwards can score twelve touchdowns in this offense, even Derek Henry regressing from what he's been in his at the height of his career can score like 18 in this offense i've i've all in on henry this year uh perhaps unsurprisingly let's go to some audience predictions we'll go through these quickly um we asked the folks on twitter to send us some of their favorite bold predictions here going into 2024 i've broken these up by position i avoided the ones that were on players that we already have talked about on the show so thank you everybody for your submissions but we did already hit on some of those players um here are the quarterback ones trevor lawrence top five quarterback aaron Rodgers, top three quarterback matthew stafford top five quarterback and Sam Darnold, top five quarterback. I, that one might have been a joke. Um, oh. of, of those four, which one stands out to you, Eric? <laughs> like of one of them that I like the most, or that I'm yeah, the most like cringe the, most the, the one we want to hate. Well, the the Rogers, <laughs> Rogers one has me most cringe, and even though I was on the Jets, I was like I can't imagine he's going to finish as a top three quarterback. He'd have to throw like forty touchdowns. Let's they all go to Brees Hall. So I'm, yeah. I'm gonna say. I mean, I guess the one that's probably most realistic, man. Sam Darnold one is kind of spicy because it's like it's all system. Like, kind of? I mean, kind of. But no, but like <laughs> spicy as in like, okay, like how do you paint this path where it's like, well, if Darnold just operates in the system, it's all, if he's like Brock Purdy plus or whatever. Then... Somebody takes his jersey and pretends to be Sam Darnold. We, that, we are, that's we how are that talking happens. about how the Vikings are such an ideal, yeah. like the best landing spot you could ever have for a rookie quarterback. Like if it ends up that I mean, Darnold Sam Darnold start... is younger than Bo Nick, so he's basically a rookie. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I, I'm, I'm really intrigued by the Lawrence top five quarterback one just because like there was so much hype for that a year ago as like, oh, he's like ascending into the elite, you know, upper echelon of quarterbacks and it didn't happen. I don't think it'll happen this year, but I, I find that to be an intriguing one. Um, tight ends, Jake Ferguson, top five tight end and Kyle Pitts tight end one. I believe that submission came with the uh, Michael Scott. No doubt about it. I am ready to get hurt again. Uh, so do you think either of those has uh, has any legs to it, Erickson? I like the Pitts one. Yeah. I, I mean, yeah, if, I we, if they I'm lose a, a key again. playmaker and Kyle Pitts becomes like the de facto, like clear cut wide receiver one on that team or pass catcher, then yeah, I could think you see it happening. d yeah. more likely Pitts tight end one or Ferguson top five? Pitts. It's, it's Pitts. I just, I just don't see the volume. Well, you can make the volume case for, for Jake Ferguson. I just don't know if the talent ceiling is there for him to get up to that spot. Like he would have to score some ridiculous amount of touchdowns. I'm going Pitts. I'm ready to get hurt again. <laughs> uh, wide receivers: Keenan Allen, barely a low end wide receiver two this year, and the uh, the other one, Jaden Reed, top five fantasy wide receiver. We also have DK Metcalf, top five in receiving yards. I don't know how they feel about the overall fantasy scoring, but Keenan Allen, barely a low end wide receiver two. Jaden Reed, top five wide receiver and DK Metcalf, top five in receiving yards. Debra, what do you think about those? Keenan Allen is a strong wide receiver too. So I'm going to take that one and put a little bit more mustard on top of it. Erickson, any thoughts on Allen, Reed, Metcalf? I feel like the Allen one is only like, yeah, his per game is going to be top 10. Then he misses like five games with a hamstring injury. And that's why he finishes where he does as a wide receiver too. But it's like, when you actually play him, he's, he's going to put up, you know, still top tier. Produ I mean, I think Caleb Williams is going to be like, that's going to be his binky. Like he's going to drop back and throw me like, where's he now? Like that's what he's going to do. So uh, it is I mean, historically tough for rookie quarterbacks to support really strong fantasy wide receivers. And yeah, Stroud didn't do it last year. We, we I just said historically long. tough. I didn't say it was impossible. But, well, I, I think yeah. it's interesting because the Bears are not a typical team that picks first overall. So like that's where you have to like kind of like yeah. adjust X because it's like most yeah. quarterbacks that can pick first of all go to a horrible team. 
which is not the case yeah. at all with the Chicago yeah, totally Bears. Valid. So that's something to kind of like keep in mind from like comparing it to like, oh, Trevor Lawrence, like he went to horrible situations, like because the number one pick always usually goes to the worst team. But in this case, it went to the Bears, who got it from the worst team. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's totally true. Uh, the last one here, and the only running back that I saw in the audience predictions that we didn't already hit on earlier in the show was Saquon Barkley, RB1. Debro, is that, you know, on the table, you think, this season? I I think it's on the table. All we have to do is see the rushing touchdowns go from Jalen Hurts to Saquon Barkley, which is not crazy to think. Again, DeAndre Swift's not there. Saquon actually gets reds on rushing attempts. Yeah, you guys both have Saquon and RB6, at least as of the most recent update on the site. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's about the right spot to be ranking him, but he is one of those guys who's not in the top three at the position, who I do think like you can paint the picture of how he ends up RB1 like, fairly easily. We're going to mm -hmm. know. I believe that the Eagles open the season in Brazil on a Friday night. We're going to know in their first goal line possession when Saquon Barkley lines up under center, be like, oh my God, Saquon's going to score 20 touchdowns this year. I drafted him. Like that's, that's yep. how this is going to play out. We're all going to like debate because they're going to not play them anytime in the preseason. We're going to be like, what's the tush push? Like what's going to happen? Is it going to be Barkley? Is it going to be Hurts? And then they're going to be in Brazil and we're going to have a great game on a Friday night because the NFL rules every single day of the week. They're always going to be on and Saquon's going to line up under center and be like, well, there's our answer. Or it's going to be Saquon's not even on the field. It's like, well, I just blew my second round pick and it's going to be Jalen Hurts 20 touchdowns again. So yeah, Saquon Barkley's. Yeah, very, we're all going to get trolled with Kenny Gainwell getting the first rushing touchdown yeah. of the season for the Eagles. All right. Thank you, everybody uh, who sent in their, their predictions. I appreciate you guys uh, replying to us on Twitter. Thank you, everybody, for listening to our, what, 30 plus predictions that we got through in this jam pack show. That was a ton of fun. So I appreciate everybody sticking around for the hour plus. For Debro and Erickson, I am Ryan Warmly. We will see you again next week. And uh, Erickson, have a good time in New Orleans. Come back safe.